Brad Schoenfeld is one of the leading authorities on body composition and training, especially around uh, weight loss and building muscle. And you might know him from his website, Look Great Naked. He recently co-authored a meta-study analysis about cold exposure and strength training, which I spoke about obliquely in a video about two weeks ago on the science of ice plunging after workouts. But since I'm not an actual scientist with a PhD on hypertrophy, I thought it would be good to bring in an actual expert to discuss the results. And so now I would, am introducing you to Brad Schoenfeld. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. First up, let's just go real general. What was the study that you put out about and how did, how did you conduct it and what were the main takeaways? Yeah, so just for clarification, we did not do an original study. This was called a meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. For those who may not know, a meta-analysis combines the existing literature. So basically, we it's a study of studies. You have certain inclusion criteria, and we took all the studies that directly compared resistance training with resistance training plus cold water immersion done before the workout. I, I'm sorry, done immediately after the workout. Um, and then looked at the muscle muscle response, the hypertrophic response post-exercise, or when I say post-study. Yeah, and, and what were the main takeaways? Um, well, the uh, primary takeaway is that there was a blunting in the CWI group. So when you actually did CWI after What's your- What's CWI? A cold water immersion. Mm -hmm. So when you do cold water immersion post-workout, uh, there was a blunting of muscle hypertrophy, which is muscle growth, the development of muscle. Uh, the studies lasted, um, I'm taxing my memory somewhat, but I think on average they were around six to 10 weeks. There were eight studies that met our inclusion criteria. I don't believe there were any less than six, and I don't believe there were any. Anyway, but they were relatively somewhat short term, but certainly enough where you can see muscle development. You can mm -hmm. accurately measure muscle development. Uh, and on a general level, there was a blunting of hypertrophy. Now, I will say that the magnitude of the blunting of the impairment was not huge. So mm. certainly you, you still grew muscle with CWI, just the response, the adaptations were less than if you just did uh, resistance training without the CWI. And, and so the idea here, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you work out, you... Uh, you know, you're making these little small tears in your muscle and there's an inflammation process that occurs during recovery, which is, you know, painful sometimes. But the that recovery moment of that inflammation is actually part of the muscle growth so that when you jump into cold water, you um, blunt uh, the, 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 the inflammation, which is actually the thing that you're trying to produce in order to get those muscle gains. Is that more or less accurate? Well, uh, so this is where it gets somewhat dicey in terms of trying to interpret the research. Number one, we did not look at the mechanistic aspects, and it's very difficult to study mechanisms. Trying to tease out what is causing a response, it's pretty easy to see a response. You can just use various measurement techniques to see whether muscles grew or didn't grow after a study is done. Trying to determine what causes that development it becomes somewhat difficult. Now, there certainly is evidence that the acute, meaning the short-term post ec immediately after an exercise session response, uh, inflammatory response, is involved in the hypertrophic, uh, overall hypertrophic adaptations over time. Interestingly, the chronic, if, so when inflammation is chronic, it actually tends to show a negative effect on hypertrophy. That's why th there's been research in non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. And the general consensus is from the research in younger individuals, there is a blunting of hypertrophy through non-steroidal uh, drugs, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, and that seems to be because it is blunting this acute response. However, in older individuals, there is somewhat of a positive response. And again, we can only uh, speculate mechanistically, but that would seem to be because older individuals tend to have chronic inflammation, which has a greater negative effect than any acute effect of that would be positive post-inflammatory. So these are things, again, that get somewhat difficult to understand. 
uh, because there's a lot of factors that can confound it. But what I will say is, is that I am not sure, and we talked about this in the paper, that that is even the mechanism involved here. So if you look at the data, so there, there is data on CWI and its effect on the acute inflammatory response. You can uh, That can be studied uh, relatively easy. And some studies show that it does blunt the acute inflammatory response, and some studies show that it does not. Uh, uh. So a- our hypothesis, uh, when we're trying to tease out mechanisms, we think a more likely ex- uh, explanatory uh, or explanation to this would be that uh, there is a blunting of the blood flow. So cold water shunts blood mm-hmm. to the skin and away from the musculature, and that can remain for, for a decent amount of time. And uh, our working theory is that, uh, working, I guess you call it hypothesis because it really hasn't been well studied, but uh, anyway, the speculation is, is that the shunt, the uh, impairment of blood flow to the musculature reduces the body's ability to deliver nutrients to the uh, tissues for repair. Mm-hmm. I mean, muscles are repaired. The, the um, post-exercise muscle protein synthetic response is brought about largely through the, um, uh, the development of um, muscle proteins through amino acids. And if, uh, if they're, you're not able to sufficiently supply the muscles with the necessary nutrients, uh, conceivably that may be explanatory. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, and I, I like that you're so measured in this because, uh, and this is something that I hit on a lot in this podcast is that there is so much information out there that going directly into mechanisms is very, very dangerous because the body is intensely, intensely complex. Uh, so that Actually, the endpoints of your study in some ways maybe are even more valid because you're just looking at the intervention of cold exposure um, versus being like, trying to puzzle out what happens from cold exposure. And as we've seen with other cold water experts like Susanna Soberg, for instance, the science on cold exposure is terrible, (laughs) right? Especially when we get into the mechanistic mechanistic stuff. Um, Well, I I will also say that uh, in line, and this is really a primary reason we did this study, there's been quite a bit of acute studies that have been done looking at muscle protein synthesis. So again, I don't know how deeply you want to get into this, but the driving factor of hypertrophy is an increase in muscle protein synthesis above protein breakdown over time. So if you perpetually have a greater protein synthetic, higher protein synthetic response versus degradation, you ultimately accrete muscle proteins and over time you'll build muscle. Uh, there is uh, quite quite a number of studies, or several at least, that have shown a blunting of muscle protein synthesis from cold water immersion. Mm-hmm. There is a number of studies that also have shown a blunting of the anabolic signaling. So the there's a cascade uh, that is involved in carrying out muscle protein synthesis, which involves various anabolic enzymes that there's a, there's a cascade of enzymes. So a, a enzymatic cascade that ultimately channels to the protein synthetic response. And this has been shown to be blunted. So this does follow a pattern where there's on the acute level, it's been shown that there is, there is a blunting that would conceivably lead to a blunting of muscle development. And in fact, that's what we did find. But again, it is not a huge, it's mm-hmm. blunted enough. Now with that, you then have to say how, how meaning practically meaningful are those uh, results and that, I would always say that would be, and it depends on your, uh, mm-hmm. your goals. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you know, one thing you mentioned with, when you're talking about NSAIDs, uh, sort of anti-inflammatory, um, drugs, it, it actually had a different effect in younger people to older people. Was there any indication that there might be an age related uh, component to the, to cold water immersion in the, in the, I believe it was eight studies that you looked at? Well, unfortunately, no, because every study involved young subjects. So that has not been looked at. These are, again, certain limitations when you look at the research. There's been no, I don't think there were any, maybe there was one that was in both men and women, but I know, I think seven out of the eight were men. So again, you can't really tease out. I don't really, I can't logically think of why women would respond differently, but until you have studies, you can't say for sure. Certainly with older individuals and there you could make a potential case why uh, that may have 
alternative uh, results on older individuals. Um, but we can't say. So since we're talking about building muscle here, what, and I know that you've written like five books on this, so this is probably a, a cheap question and an impossible one, but what is the best way to build muscle, uh, would you say? <laughs> Well, that would require a very long <laughs> podcast. I mean, there, you know, that that ultimately, when you say the best way to optimize muscle building, that involves a very nuanced uh, understanding both of the science and and the individual, because there's not a cookie cutter prescription. Each person mm -hmm. responds somewhat differently, and there are various principles or guidelines that I can give. But again, that would be a very lengthy podcast, which I'm not sure you want to go into, but it involves resistance training. I, I will, to boil it down, consistent resistance training uh, with um, somewhat higher volumes, uh, spectrum of repetition loading. Um, anyway, the, it is a very nuanced topic. I, I don't... I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole because it will end up being a very long talk. Yeah, I'm feeling that I'm on the edge of a precipice there with any follow-up question because obviously um, every individual is different. Hi, I am just doing a very quick interruption of this show to say thank you for being here. And this is that sort of scheduled announcement where I say it would be great if you would consider supporting the work that I do. I am a completely independent journalist and I love being able to do interviews and long form content uh, on a shoestring budget. So if you are the kind of person who likes uh, seeing this sort of stuff and wants to get early access to the stuff I do, come check my stuff out on Patreon. Uh, we have like lots of subscriber levels coming in, starting at like five bucks a month. I'd love you to be a part of that. And if not, no worries, you'll still be able to see all of my stuff for free here on YouTube and my podcast and my free newsletter. Um, go check all that stuff out and you know hit that like and subscribe button. And without any further ado, we are back to the show. Consistency does seem to be a, a, an important component. When I look at like sort of the work of um, you know Steve Magnus, for instance, it's not about the one optimal thing that you do in a moment, but actually things you do over time. Would that be fair to say? Well, absolutely. Uh, consistency is the most important thing. Well, that and training with sufficient effort. So you could be very consistent, but if you're using suboptimal effort, you're going to have very limited ability to build muscle. So the the most important variable uh, when we talk about the resistance training variables is the effort that you put in. You need to train. You need to challenge your muscles beyond their present capacity over time. But within that, you need to do it consistently. If you just train once, you could train very hard, but just do it once a month, and that's not going to mm -hmm. really do anything either. So there has to be repetition over the course of weeks, months, years. And then, like I said, the manipulation of variables on an individual level. We have some science to provide guidelines, but uh, there is no cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. Everyone does not respond the same to the manipulation of variables. Sure. What was the, when you said that the difference was small, I think I'd like to dig down into that a little bit more. And I'm talking about um, cold water immersion after working out. Um, how small is this? is this? Is this small enough to be like sort of negligible, do what you want? Or is this actually, maybe you should switch some of your chain training protocols? Like how, wh how big is that gap, would you say? It's a great question. And the way we determine this is through what's called an effect size. So when you do a meta analysis, basically you are combining all studies into one big study by statistically mm -hmm. uh, standardizing the results mm -hmm. uh, because different studies use different metrics for their uh, to, to determine muscle development, which by the way, would be a limitation because some studies use like uh, DEXA, others use bi bioelectrical impedance, others use MRI and mm -hmm. ultrasound. So some were more accurate than others in their interpretation. But anyway, in order to standardize these, we look at what's called a standardized mean difference. And um, the standardized mean difference by, by that definition, by the, by the metric that we use, was a re relatively small effect. It was We had good confidence that there was an effect. But the magnitude of the effect, we didn't, it's, it's not quantified in a percentage and it's somewhat difficult to say. But what I would say to you is that in my opinion, uh, based on the results, that for a bodybuilder or even someone that just wants to uh, you know, get 
optimize their muscle development or even come, not necessarily even optimize, but get more muscle development, it could be meaningful. Uh, for someone who just wants to feel better and yeah, if I get some muscle, that's a secondary thing, then I don't think it's meaningful. So again, that's where there's the spectrum based on, on your goals. I would say that, uh, anyone who does want to build, has a goal of building muscle that the results potentially could be meaningful. It's not going to be the difference between not fitting into a shirt or fitting into a shirt probably, (laughs) but, uh, but if, you know, or having your sleeves like bulging out and needing an extra, extra large size. But it certainly could be a noticeable difference, potentially. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I certainly know a lot of people who are athletes, and I'm not an athlete. I'm, I'm a journalist. Um, uh, and I have friends who are like properly jacked, like big, big dudes with their six packs and the whole thing, who um, do religiously ice bath and sauna every day. At, at the end of the day, they, I think they do their workouts in the morning. Um, uh, and maybe the a second workout at like noon and it hasn't certainly impeded them, uh, in there. And I've, I've actually, I showed them your study and he was like, huh, that's interesting. Cool. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. And I think this leads to something that you wrote at the end of your, um, I think this was at the end of your blog post on the, on the topic, which I'll link to, um, for anyone who's interested in reading it. Uh, and where you wrote, if optimizing muscular adaptations is not a high priority and you enjoy ice baths, feel free to take the plunge. Our results show that while CWI, which is cold water immersion, does blunt hypertrophy, you can still make some gains when employing the strategy. Ultimately, adherence to exercise is paramount to anything that keeps you in the gym. It's a plus, and there are a plethora of health-related benefits to resistance training, which is, you know, again, I'm just repeating what you just said before this, is that it's it's about getting that consistency. Uh, and I think to, to build on this, the question that I have for you is how do we think about the difference between scientific results that come in at their sort of slow pace uh, and coaching philosophy where you're actually trying to motivate, say, a team or a specific bodybuilder to do it? How do you get those the, the, like that motivation component to match up to um, what the science says? Yeah, so before answering that, I do want to push back a little on the point you made that it didn't seem to impede their gains, the jacked people you know. Mm-hmm. You don't know that. I mean, Fair. they might be jacked and they could have been more jacked if they had have done it. So that's mm-hmm. generally a logical fallacy that's often made with bodybuilders. And they say, oh, the, what he's doing has to be the best thing since, you know, since air conditioning. And, mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean that that bodybuilder might not have gotten even better results uh, if they had have done something else. So it's always something to keep in mind that just because someone might look the part doesn't mean they might not look the part plus exponentially better uh, if they had done something else. So Mm -hmm. with that said, great question uh, as far as um, the practical application of science. And here is, I think the, uh, in the most simple terms I could say is that science from an applied standpoint is never going to tell you what to do. Uh, we never look to science to say do, or almost never say do this, not that. Science gives provides guidelines, and just like you read from my blog post, the study that we have, you need you you could just take it. Some people just say, ah, uh, CWI bad, no, you know, don't want to. That's not the point of of these types of studies. You have to look at it in context with goals and other factors. And my in my blog post. Uh, certainly I tried to convey those nuances, even in our, when you're publishing a study, there's some limitations to what you can get into from that standpoint. But um, ultimately, number one, uh, the science is lagging what happens in the field because generally science progresses from what I want to study things that people are testing out athletes are testing out in the field. So first they have to test them out and then the science will, We'll try to look into that. And you one study is only going to be a piece in a puzzle. So you you need multiple studies, and that can take a long time to ultimately develop that type of uh, understanding from the science to have any strong conclusions. So you then look at the strength of the evidence. So with science, scientific evidence, we can have anything from very weak evidence to very strong evidence. Um, meta-analyses often, if they're properly carried out, tend to provide stronger evidence because they're synthesizing the body of the literature. But even then, 
again, and we've just hopefully covered uh, that pretty well, that uh, there is going to be nuances to this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would point out, I think this is another very important thing to to remember, that um, the uh, w- when we look at something, let's say a topic like CWI, number one, you could do it acutely. Uh, it's not like we looked at it, it was done the same time, you know, within 10 minutes or so, post-exercise every time. Number one, you you can do it at different times. That hasn't been studied. I have some doubts that it would matter, uh, but it might attenuate at least the impairments. Number two, nothing says you have to do it after every workout. So you might just decide to do it once. I, look, I'm feeling sore. I want to try. You know, it makes me feel better. Uh, and there's no evidence that doing it very occasionally once a month or so, a couple of times a month even, would necessarily have any negative results. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, which is also interesting, I'm not convinced in my review of the literature that CWI actually does anything to improve recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, that the thought that it actually, like I said, the evidence on inflammation is uh, equivocal. And, and again, that could be a bad thing if it actually did uh, suppress acute consistently, uh, suppress acute, the acute inflammatory response. But, um, it could just be a placebo placebo for those who don't know is something that you think is, is helping you, but there's really nothing, no underlying effects, no underlying, uh, um, reason why it should do that. And it's just a hard thing to shit. You can't, there's what's called a sham, uh, under certain circumstances, you can use a sham procedure. It happens all the time in supplements where you give someone, here's the supplement you give and you give someone else like sugar water or something and they think they're getting, you don't tell them which supplement they're getting. So you're taking out that the uh, mental effect that they think they are getting a benefit from it. When you're doing CWI, you know you're getting punched into a cold bath, right. getting an ice bath. You can't sham that. Uh, so, uh, again, it could be that this is just the placebo effect that people get in. They're like, oh my God, this feels, you know, I'm, I'm like, I, I can't move now. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling something happening to my muscles. And it also could just be that it temporarily is blunting that effect and that makes them sure. feel they're recovering better. So these are all things that need to be mm-hmm. taken into account. Have you looked into any of the science around, um, people using cold exposure for weight loss. Um, this is, this is a, you know, this has been a big thing for many years and something that I've looked into and I've, I've sort of come across in both ways. There's for instance, a lot of research on brown fat, brown fat activation, because brown fat will supposedly suck calories from your body and can be used or, or sorry, will metabolize white fat uh, for heat energy and then, you know, instigate weight loss. And there's a lot of people selling protocols about how to do that. Um, I have sort of begun to think that perhaps maybe acutely in the short term, maybe there's a sort of increased en- energy expenditure, which occurs with um, cold water immersion. But over the long term, I'm noticing, and this is con- purely anecdotal, um, I'm noticing people who have been doing this for a long time actually gaining a lot of weight over time because perhaps the body chooses to do an insulation strategy in response to extensive cold water instead of a um, energy expenditure uh, uh, model. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I have not looked into that, uh, the research on that. So here's what I'll say. There's certainly good research that shivering is a uh, is a response that increases internal heat thermogenesis and thus uh, can help with conceivably help with fat loss. Um, I know there's been I remember a book going way back uh, into the 90s I believe uh, that promoted turning on your air conditioner really high so that you're you know shivering all the time to as a strategy to lose weight. I, I think that's somewhat silly and not certainly nothing I would recommend there. Uh, it would be fun. To, 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 be, sure. <laughs> to stay uncomfortable and have your teeth chattering all the time doesn't seem like a, I think there are better ways to go about losing weight. Uh, on the other hand, there is, I, I know theoretically, um, being in cold water conceivably can cause the body to want to, I think like you just pointed out, uh, 
insulate itself with fat. I mean, they use the uh, example where seals, you know, develop this layer of blubber around them to insulate themselves from the cold weather. So I'm not sure how that would play out. I just think that that just logically to me, that would not be a strategy that I think would be tenable. Or when I say tenable, I just think it would be a the wrong way to go about losing weight. I think that there are much easier strategies that aren't as onerous. Let's, I want to get a little um, more general here for a second. You have a long career in, in the, the muscle gaining and fitness space, and you've seen a lot of trends come and go in that time. What would you say makes fitness trends take off and what are their time horizons in reality? Like, you know, the, you might be doing something in, for five years, 10 years or whatever. And they're like, oh no, that was terrible. And we get to a new paradigm, I guess you could say. Do you have any insight to what makes things take off and, and how things change over time? Yeah, so usually, or I should at least say often, tre- quote unquote trends uh, manifest through celebrities uh, doing things. That's uh, quite often at least um, brought into public attention through celebrities. With social media now, there's, uh, it's, we're kind of changing into a society that TikTok influencers, et cetera, can drive these types of trends. Um, Usually it involves, in the fitness field, people that are jacked, uh, you know, that uh, that look the part, that are taking their shirt off. And, um, but uh, other, I mean, certainly there are health-related factors that can be uh, promoted through um, sometimes unscrupulous, sometimes well-meaning uh, educators, but sometimes people that just want to earn money and, and have credentials that would give themselves uh, cachet as far as someone to turn to. And how long do they last? Uh, it would depend on the I think fad often is a better word because trend can be, I mean, there are, there are things, certainly shifts, paradigm shifts that are uh, not, I wouldn't call trends. They are based on science. I mean, I'll give you one that I've been heavily involved in is the uh, focus now that you don't necessarily need to lift heavy loads to make, to build muscle. I mean, there's, when I was an up and coming exercise scientist, it was promoted that and preached that you needed to lift heavy and that if you lifted light weights, Basically, you were not going to build muscle. It was glorified cardio. And we now have compelling evidence. Our lab has carried out a lot of research in this, but many others have as well, that uh, loading across a wide spectrum of of zones, uh, of um, loading zones, repetition ranges, can promote similar whole muscle hypertrophy to heavy loads, provided that you train close to failure, that you are lifting with a high level of effort. Mm. So so there are things, there are paradigm shifts. When I, when I would talk about a paradigm shift, it's something that is happening because there is evidence to support that. Other things, uh, you know, become fads, if you will. Uh, and that those usually have somewhat short shelf lives, usually a mm-hmm. couple of years or so. So it depends what you call a fad or not. Yeah. You know- Earlier, you had mentioned when I asked you this sort of like very leading question, uh, which was, what's the best way to build muscle? You had an interesting uh, way to frame the response where you said, well, you know, what is optimal for you? I can't tell. And then it's, it's obviously equivocal based on a number of factors. And yet there are also an entire world of fitness influencers and, and protocols and all these things which tell you about how to optimize yourself. Um, sort of like that's that's the word. Like if I if I named this video Brad Schoenfeld's keys to optimizing muscle gains and or cold water exposure and or whatever, uh, it's going to get a lot of interest. You Why? wouldn't do that though, right? No, 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 no. no. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Um, because I, I, I personally, my take. Well, I, let me not tell you my take. I want to hear your take. What what is going on with this this? Uh, desire to to optimize everything. So it, it ultimately depends what the goal of the individual is. So from a fitness standpoint, uh, if you're talking about hypertrophy, if you're a bodybuilder, optimization is everything. Uh, that's going to be the difference between you winning, potentially winning or losing your competition, being an also rep. For the average individual, they might not care about optimization. Their goal, hypertrophy, might be a completely secondary or 
irrelevant to them. If you're a distance runner, hypertrophy not only wouldn't be a goal, it would be a negative. Maybe you want to do CWI. Uh, somewhat joking, but you know, yeah, you, there's no uh, no benefit and actually some detriments potentially to hypertrophy. So ultimately, optimization only matters if you're interested in optimizing that factor, and then. It also has to come into play as to what are you willing to do for the optimization? So there's a cost benefit to everything. Uh, I can tell you what will optimize, or I can give you guidelines what will optimize hypertrophy. You might not have the desire or the time to put in the necessary time and effort to achieving that. So if I tell you, hey, look, here are the guidelines to optimize uh, hypertrophy, and you're going to need to train X number of days a week for X number of hours. Mm -hmm. It's like, I only have two hours a week to train. Well, Mm -hmm. that's nice, but you're not you then are not going to be a candidate for optimization. So it's saying, look, health, I think everyone wants to conceivably optimize their health. Um, but, you know, what are you willing to do and how important is that optimization versus getting, all right, I, I'm pretty close to optimizing because you're never going to know anyway. Like optimization, as I mentioned, always in, in virtually every uh, outcome you're going to look at, including health, will be specific to the individual. Uh, some of this is is a little beyond my area of expertise, but when you're talking about like uh, atherosclerosis, the uh, buildup of plaques, from my readings of the literature, some people oxidize uh, low density lipoproteins very readily and some don't. So some people may be more prone to to atherosclerosis by eating saturated fat where others wouldn't. And that's just a basic example where you can't give a one size my point is you not, can't necessarily give a one-size-fits-all optimization strategy. Uh, and then ultimately, are they willing to eat the way they need to? Are they willing to mm-hmm. uh, sleep the way they need to, et cetera, to achieve And, and it seems it seems to require a great deal of almost, you could say, hypervigilance. Like the especially in sort of the public media, this idea that you can optimize by taking a certain supplement protocol, a certain you know, a stack of neurotransmitters and then hyper look at your diet. And and these are people who are maybe not trying to get that last one or 2% that optimal really gets you, but they're, they're trying to go from, I don't know, 50% optimal, whatever that means up to better health. And they're, and they're sort of trying to be race cars. They're trying to be, to get that last 2% when these bigger gains can be be maintained by, as you say in your paper, being consistent, right? Like optimal might just be, be consistent in the stuff you do uh, versus, you know, I've always been worried about media influencers with their six packs and their, you know, like Laird Hamilton, who I actually really like as a person, I think he's great. Um, But people are trying to be Laird Hamilton. It's like, well, why would I want to be Laird Hamilton or Michael Jordan or whoever else? I am never going to get there. I shouldn't try to imitate their fitness plans. Yeah. And I, I can tell you, it's a really great point from, I'll speak specifically in my area of expertise, mm-hmm. which is muscle building. You can achieve a majority of your gains, muscular gains, strength gains, et cetera, from a minimalistic, as long as you're consistent, you know, two, three days a week, a uh, half hour, 45 minute sessions. Uh, so you're talking an hour, hour and a half to two hours a, a week, uh, provided you are consistent and you train hard, that you're training relatively close to failure, the majority of your gains will be achieved. So everything else, again, the optimization comes, yeah, if you want to be a bodybuilder or gain more, you know, achieve your genetic potential, you're going to need to do more than that. But I I also, to your point, uh, from a supplementation uh, standpoint, when with respect to muscle building and and strength gains, generally resistance training-based gains, Supplementation is the cherry on the Sunday, the proverbial Sunday. Uh, it's fi- less than five percent for the most part of your gain. So it's going to give you at most a, a small edge. Yeah, if you're a bodybuilder, that can be a meaningful edge. Um, but certainly, like you said, it's uh, the majority of it is training hard, getting proper nutrition, particularly getting uh, the optimal amount of protein or the necessary amount of protein in and getting proper rest and, and recovery. How would you say in, in, in the world of sort of fitness science and maybe to some degree health science in general, but we'll just stick to fitness for you right now. How do we think rationally about scientific evidence? Like how do we spot things 
that are hype and how does we spot things that are, oh yeah, this is actually a really important result. Cause I, I, I feel like the comments in my, my YouTube videos are often people who are just really, really confused. Uh, even when somebody has PhD at the end of their name, because I feel like personally, I want to be open enough to try new things. Like I want to be like, oh, cool. There's a new idea. I want to see if I can go try this. And, and, and maybe that's a key to progress. On the other hand, a lot of that's flim flam. And I have been burned several times when I've tried to be open about things. So how do you as a person or as a scientist, how do you navigate this? Or, or at least what would you recommend other people do to navigate that? Yeah, so I think, and this is, uh, again, one of my hobby horses is that uh, most people do not have proper, are not taught proper critical thinking skills. I think that is a fault certainly in the U.S., I don't know in other countries, but certainly here in the U.S., it's a fault of the uh, system, the, our school system. We teach math, we teach uh, science, we teach you know the basic history, but we don't teach people how to think critically uh, about many of these things. And having a basic understanding of the scientific method and, and critical thinking skills, I think should be a part of the uh, education process. Um, that's my... Get, I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, but with that said, you need to develop, if you don't have that, you need to develop that if you really want to understand that ultim or ultimately you're going to be prone towards the endless amount of hucksters that are on social media. And and look, with that said, there's also plenty of really uh, people that I, I really look up to and admire and, and call colleagues on social media as well. We're trying to do good things, mm -hmm. but Often they get overshadowed by the you know one plus million uh, follower influencers who are not, and basically they're the people that take their shirts off from a fitness standpoint. Um, and uh, I think understand if you're not going to have the critical thinking skills, you need to be able to identify those who are not out for uh, to sell you some you know bill of goods, if you will, and that uh, just are looking to convey science. Uh, so it is, it is tough. And look, I, I think, uh, so if you're asking me in an area that I'm not uh, of sufficient expertise, I try to identify those who are uh, researchers in the field, people who I would, who, well, again, I have certainly very good critical thinking skills and can, can make that leap to, mm -hmm. to understand who they are, but also who are ready and willing to communicate ideas in a somewhat consumer friendly fashion, because Many of the topics they they can be talking in their ivory tower to other, uh, you know, other doctoral, other PhDs, researchers in their own area of expertise. Which I'm, if you're talking rocket science, I'm not going to understand that lingo. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would need someone that's going to be able to communicate that in a fairly consumer friendly fashion. My heuristic for trying to understand whether somebody is going to be. Uh okay or not, like somebody to take advice is I, I check to see if they sell products and or supplements. Cause I feel like if someone sells a supplement, they're probably not real. <laughs> they're probably influenced by the products that they sell. That's my heuristic when I go out and I look at people, cause it's so easy to get conflicts of interest out there. Um, especially since some of these people are pulling in literally millions of dollars, um, for instance, with AG1, Athletic Greens, um, millions of dollars might come in from that. They have every incentive to follow the money in favor, in favor of what the science actually says. Or maybe they will just reinterpret the science to be more favorable. Yeah, look, conflicts of interest in, that, in this type of thing can be uh, an issue. Um, I, I don't judge people for how they want to make money, but that certainly would be something you would take into account. Uh, and, and yes, I do not sell supplements and I, I wouldn't. Excellent. Yeah, I don't sell any supplements either. Um, so uh, there we go. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and, you know, sort of giving your wisdom um, yeah. to my audience. And uh, if, if people are going to go find you on the internet, I'm going to put a link down to your blog post about um, CWI down below, but where else should they look for you? I would just say Google me. Um, <laughs> I'm on Instagram, Twitter in particular, but uh, yeah, you Google me, you'll get all the all the info you need. Awesome. All right. Well, I really appreciate you being on here. And from uh, Pokey Bear LLC in Denver, Colorado, this was Scott Carney Investigates.